This is Alexandra from Brissett. And this is Paul from the Time Repair Corporation. And we both welcome you to our monthly interchange. A meeting of the minds, people reaching outside of themselves in an attempt to reach a deeper understanding of our different perspectives. And it is through this coming together of perspectives that we hope to serve the divergent, the honey maths, the change makers, uh, the people we like to call angels of chaos, in short, people who don't fit into molds. We want to achieve that by inviting those troublemakers from around the globe to come together and by digging into their experiences and unique views. Views which we are bringing forth and supporting with models for change, models for sustainability, models for education in the 21st century. Um, to design a system that is actually fit for the kind of world we live in. But there's also another dimension to it. We want to grow that conversation. We want to make sure that more people are able to weigh in and contribute to that practical creation of tomorrow. So reach out to us and let's make this a borderless interchange. And today's guest is actually... I think we can call her a globetrotter, um, but she's also a change maker. And we actually met in 2017 in Berlin. Uh, we were representing our respective countries as G20 on global changers. Um, and actually it was in 2017 and 2017 feels like another lifetime ago, um, but it wasn't that long ago. Anyways, so now she's living in Canada. Her name is Lina Struli. Um, and the least we can say about her is that she has navigated so many different sectors in so many different countries um, and so many interests in terms of supporting communities worldwide, in terms of human development, in terms of food startups. Um, and in matter of fact, she worked for the World Bank for a while. She worked with the UN for a while. She nurtured the entrepreneurial community in Palestine for a while, and now she's based in Canada and uh, developing and leading Dafero, which is a food startup that creates date spread. Very nutri nutritious, uh, and it employs people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, refugees, uh, people who have migrated because of certain conditions. So everything that she does is based on this idea that we need to empower people who are living at the edges. We need to empower people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and to give them back hope in a future of prosperity. So please welcome with me, Lina Zdruli. Lina, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Thank you both so much for, for inviting me. This is really exciting. It's so different and refreshing. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited for our conversation today. And I think we're going to have a quite an interesting conversation because uh, conversation today, because with all the things that we have kind of discussed lately, um, I think we're going to have a really interesting kind of journey across space and across time. And perhaps the first thing that I want to ask you uh, and that I really want to kind of dig deep into that is that you have lived in several countries and that you have worked with several entities. You've worked with entities as big as the UN and the World Bank, but you've also went on the other side of the spectrum with a much smaller, small medium enterprise, with a food startup and so on and so forth. Um, my question to you, which is very much anchored in this need for adaptability and need to kind of go with the flow of everything that is going on with us and still make it work for us and for people around us. So the question is, what do you think has truly helped you most uh, to make the necessary adaptations throughout your career in, in terms of moving to another country or to working in a different sector or founding your own startup and so on and so forth? So what made you really successfully navigate all these different environments? I, that's a great question, uh, one which I haven't pondered on in a while, so it's going to be interesting for me to self-reflect. Um, I think on the one hand, 
I grew up moving. I grew up moving several times before I was 18. Um, I was born in Albania in a, in a pretty difficult time. Um, I, they, I wrote in my master's uh, application that I was born 30 days after they toppled the statue of the former dictator. Um, so it was really turbulent times. And, um, and my family, I was really little, um, but my family always created a sense of normalcy. Um, and I don't, all I remember is, is like love and happiness and everyone saying you can do anything. And um, when uh, we moved from Albania when I was a toddler, um, because my dad was the, in the first round of Fulbright Fellows from the U.S., uh, from Albania to the U.S., once those relations were reopened. Um, and from then we moved several times because he worked for the European Commission. He did a lot of country-based projects. And so it became a way of life saying, okay, we're here. Um, you have a family and a community that loves you. Everyone always says you're like you're supported, but now we got to pack up and move somewhere else. And sometimes we had to move somewhere else where I didn't speak the language. When we moved to Italy, I, um, the, I remember the teacher in the, in the middle school, I was 12 or 13. He didn't want to admit me to the school because he said, she doesn't speak Italian. How is she going to learn? And my dad was trying so hard. He's like, no, but she can understand. Just, and he, he asked me, how old are you? And I answered 11. And so the principal was telling my dad, see, she doesn't speak Italian. And my dad was like, but she understood you. And she, and like, and so it was always like this. Like sometimes the world around me doubted and said, you're too little. I was always petite. Like I was all, and I've, I've, 30 years old, I still, <laughs> like height-wise, it's it just stayed there. And imagine as a kid, very petite, and sometimes people around you, you can't do this, you can't do that. My mom signed me up to bas in a basketball team, all boys. Imagine how small I was in comparison to, and I cried for a week, I don't want to go. My mom was like, no, you're going to go. I don't know why it was all boys team. I don't know if that part was planned. But just to say that, I grew up in an environment where the external world all very often doubted if anything said you're completely incapable, but my internal world, mostly my parents and extended family, even though we grew up away from them um, over the phone or in this, said, you can, you can, you can, you can. There's nothing that you can't. Imagine my mom telling the, the, the tiniest kid in the class that you can be on the basketball team with the boys. Like that's, that's how, my, how crazy my parents are. <laughs> and so I think that was, that was really important as a kid. And, and I, I learned that and I learned how, um, as I grew up, how other kids didn't have it and, and how much my parents tried to support them and give that to them too. Um, I have friends who go visit my parents when I'm not there in Italy um, because they they really love giving that type of confidence and joy. So I think that was super important to have that at least somebody be your cheerleader until you're able to be your own cheerleader. And so now that I'm older, that I've seen a lot of things and lived a lot of different good and then awful things, I I've gone to the mindset where I'm my own cheerleader. So like my, my professional background, from the outside, it looks so random. Like what does the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Vancouver have to do with desertification in, in Germany? What does that have to do with refugees in Ethiopia or entrepreneurship in Palestine or African date spread? which seems like the most random of all. And, and I thought about it and every, ex, everything that I did, it was, all, it was honestly never the low hanging fruit. It was always the high hanging fruit. It was like, what's the most, how can I make my life as difficult as possible? Yes, I'm gonna go for that. <laughs> and my mom would, there's an expression in Albanian, instead of catching your ear like this, you go like this, like, 
Okay, that was weird. But, but you might have it in other countries too, right? So it's like my, my parents at some point, especially my mom, why do you choose the hardest thing? You can get this job that is like, you could be accepted. Why do you? And, and I think it was from like having this base of security that then I installed and, and realizing that even if I, I tried something and I sucked, it didn't matter. Honestly, I sucked at basketball. I, I never in, in that whole year or however long I did it, not once did I make a hoop. Not once. <laughs> I just, there was something about the net and the, never. But because I was the smallest one, I could steal the ball from the other teammates and pass it on to those who could. Smart. So, <laughs> uh. Like, because they didn't see me or I would fall. I, I could like take it out without making a foul, without touching them, without tripping. And so I went from being the person that absolutely nobody wanted on their team. Like I, I would come home crying, nobody picked me. I was last to like being the first one because they're like, okay, we want the tiny one because... Not, then she became our secret asset and so I think that's kind of what I learned to do is understanding that I'm gonna definitely super suck at some things at that job or at that challenge but it doesn't matter because I'm I know that I will find what I can succeed in and I'm gonna latch myself onto that so that's why I tried all kinds of random things uh, I did a virtual reality project I don't know two things about coding or 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 proper design or anything, but I, I started and managed that project and I had so much fun. And then I learned about Unity and how the, the software works. But from from like an external perspective, it was it was a completely different language. But I was like, yeah, I can like an international relations student can totally do this hyper technical design <laughs> thing. Like I got this. Um, so I, I really think that that's what it is. And I, I, at this point, I'm not scared to know when to take a step back. I, I don't feel like you have to fit the shoe and you have to like, now you put that shoe, so now you walk in it. No, like you can donate that shoe. You can, you can give it off. Like you don't have to throw it out, be sustainable, donate it, but you don't have to keep building blisters if it's not something that fits you anymore because we change and we adapt. I think it's ridiculous to say that, oh, because at 17 years old, you decided to study this thing. So now at 57, how dare you do something different? I mean, that's ridiculous, I think. And I, I remember at a point in my life when I was really self-doubting and everything, I read this quote that said, if you're not embarrassed of the person you were the year before, you didn't grow enough. And I thought that was really cool. That was that that kind of unlocked something in me as I was thinking like, oh, why didn't I do this? So I rambled on for a lot, but I think I really think like being your own internal cheerleader was a big thing, and not being not being scared to to suck at things, and then knowing that I can't stop. Like I don't have this is not this is not like a forever contract. <laughs> Really no, that was absolutely amazing. And I think uh, you can recognize the pattern of the basketball team uh, with all boys, all taller than you in, in other areas of your life. So it's kind of a, something, it's interesting how the experiences that we have during childhood kind of embed in us a way of thinking, a way of doing, an approach to life, a perspective, uh, that we replicate later on without even noticing because it's 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 a given and other people would look at you and would see okay this is super weird why would you do a virtual reality project if you don't have a background in coding why would you go towards human development if you have a background in international relations and you have worked with the world bank and the un and so on and so forth but what people don't realize is that behind that, there's this kind of an acquired taste of wanting to pursue the challenge, of wanting to set the bar higher than what it is and discovering along the way. Because you eventually discovered that you had an asset, you had a talent, you had something special that you were capable of communicating and sharing with that context that is kind of like a desert. Because it doesn't have anything that 
would, would give back something to you, but it does. It depends on how you interact with it and what you do with what you have. So I think this is, this is absolutely wonderful. And it says a lot about adaptability because when the environment is, is harsh, when the environment is difficult, when people around you are pulling you down, uh, adaptability is going to be very important. And I love what you said about being your own cheerleader and being your own kind of supporter and so on and so forth. But I, I want to follow up question with that. How did you manage to become your own cheerleader? Because when, when, when we're young, when we're kids, it's very difficult to do that. It has to be external. But how do you transfer this, this external validation to an internal validation? I, for me, it came in undergrad. It came in undergrad when I finally like detached from my family. They were in Italy. I went back to Canada. Um, and, and I think that's when like, I really like, you know, the little like seedling, like I put it in an open field and it was like, either you survive or you dry up. And I just like started to uh, do a lot of different projects that I, I just didn't have the opportunity to do them where I, where I spent um, my teenage years. So um, it, it's a wonderful place, but um, in the south of Italy, but it, it just didn't have the same types of projects and opportunity. The school I was in, I had to know Italian. That's why the example of she doesn't speak Italian. The closest English school was four hours away in Naples. So either I learned Italian or I didn't go to school. <laughs> there was there was no, <laughs> like you couldn't just choose to go to an English speaking school. There was nothing. Um, and so when I when I went to undergrad is when I, I met people. Some people put me really down. Most put, Most really helped me, lift me up. And those who lifted me up were saying, why don't you try this? Why don't you go to this club? And so pff, I, I subscribed myself into every club, every opportunity, every like, I was, you know, when you see those movies and it's like, hi, I'm like president of the, I was that kid. I was possibly the annoying one. Uh, now that I, now like 11 years later, I was like, well, I, I really, I see watch movies. I'm like, I really hope I wasn't like that, but I got super involved in in the most random things ever. And and the times that I, I succeeded in those, I was like, oh, cool. Like, I, I actually took a step back and thought, oh, cool. Like, I managed to do that. I had never, like, heard about this topic before. That's cool. Maybe I'll take a course on it. Maybe I'll do like this. And I think bit by bit, like the tiny wins, the, the really small ones, I kind of like in my mind, I was like, oh, cool, I did that. Oh, uh, this course I had no background on that you needed a background on. I got a really good grade on that. Cool, check. And so I think what I did over those years was like accumulate these tiny little boxes of like success. And, and, and I was always also the person who would just, I just shoot my shot. Like in basketball, I would shoot my shot. I never got the hoop. <laughs> it's okay. But like in undergrad, if there was an application come the fourth year, that's when really like my life changed because I took three years of like little successes, put them in my pocket. Come the fourth year, I applied for everything, every conference, every speech, every like whatever it was, I was, I was applying. And, um, and I remember I really wanted to go to this leadership program in Dubai, but I couldn't afford it. And so I, I needed to get scholarships, but there was no scholarship in my school for something like that. So I went to the, uh, like the president's office every week for like two months <laughs> and, and to like saying like, okay, this is why I need to do this. Blah, blah. And when I went into the office, like, I don't know, for the 11th time, one of the admin um, he, he was Australian and I can't replicate the Australian accent, but in his Australian accent, he, he was like, you're a persistent little sucker. <laughs> Annoying works. <laughs> Annoying works sometimes. Uh, and it was so funny in how he said it. And I, I feel like I should like frame that because that, that's who I became. I became a persistent little sucker. And, <laughs> 
and, and I, I just, I wouldn't stop. And when I managed that, and, and then I started an organization, uh, started a nonprofit, I, I did research, I convinced my professors to let me do exams earlier so I could go to like Pakistan and Oman to do research. I mean, there was so many things that I did that at that point I graduated and I was like, cool, I can do anything. <laughs> And, I, you know, it, it comes with, I like, being 22, 23, and I, um, I had graduated, and then I, I didn't get into a master's program that I really wanted. So I had accumulated all these successes. I thought I could do everything, anything. I told myself I could do anything. And then in my mind, I was like, I have to go to this one program. And so that's the only master's I applied for, and I was going to go straight out of undergrad. Well, surprise, surprise. I didn't get it, even though everyone said I would have. And that's when pff, it all came crashing again. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I, I was super lost. And so I spent four months half in nature, half in, in, in doing random things. And then one day, and I felt kind of like upset, kind of lost. And one day, my... Uh, my dad, my dad trying to encourage me, he sent me a newsletter, like, look at this newsletter there, they have jobs there. So I see one and it was at the UN. And it said, you need a master's degree in, in an environmental or semi te related technical field with and you need experiences preferred. I just came out of undergrad with international relations. And in my mind, I was like, I'm qualified. <laughs> And so, <laughs> because I published this one paper once on that certification, like I'm so qualified for this. And so, so I did it. I, I, I got the spark back. I shot my shot. I did the inter, I didn't know anyone. I mean, this was like completely external and, and you know, the UN, how it works, how difficult it is to come in externally. And, and I, I did the interview. I talked about my paper, my blah, blah. And then they got me and I went. And I think that's when like, boom, again, I got the confidence. So I, I, I learned that like, okay, obviously you're not gonna have every success, of obviously, because otherwise like that's, that's not even, that's not life, like that's not reality. You can't just succeed. Um, but that any time I really wanted, like really, really wanted something and it was the right next step that, that I could achieve it. And I, I think that's what, gave me like just just shooting that shot even though and I now I never limit myself because of like oh this is the criteria I don't care about what criteria they've written because to be honest in the past like since that that happened past eight years almost every opportunity I've gotten I have not matched the criteria I've my my startup has not made the minimum month uh, like monthly revenue I still got that program it wasn't in the right field still got that like now I don't I don't care I don't give a beep about criteria because <laughs> I I've realized that that there's always an exception always always an exception and and that's like if, if I really think it's worthwhile and it's worth my time trying to shoot that shot I'll go for it it's really valuable and I think that's really important for people to remember um it's it's a difficult idea because here and here in Finland and for the past 10 years I've been dealing with this specific sort of cultural outlook there's yeah. this idea that um the rules are the rules and this is sort of an unspoken rule here in Finland, and pretty much everybody follows it without thinking about it. It's not something questioned. If something doesn't fit, they don't necessarily have the flexibility, the adaptability to be able to figure out what to do with an exception. And so a lot of people will have difficulty here integrating into the Finnish culture, working into the, the business and work world because of that um, that odd disconnect with the, with the inability to handle exceptions, because effectively, if you're multicultural, you're, you're coming from a very different world and you're used to adapting to at least some extent, and you're used to not necessarily fitting into expectations. But I think that that's a really important aspect of 
of adaptability. I'd like to ask specifically, as far as that multicultural background, how do you think that those, those experiences really help to shape or mold your view of the world itself? I, I think it really helps in, in how I see others at a certain, in certain environments. So uh, I'll give like a quick practical example. Um, I, I had participated in a Japanese Canada program and two, two Canadian, it's called JCAC, two Canadian students, two Japanese. We went to Tokyo, we did different programs, sit on a project, work on it. And we, and the, the, it was such a collision of two worlds. We were working on aging cities and society and the, the, they don't have enough caretakers for the elderly. And so the, the Canadian side, we work on the project. She was saying, okay, well, um, we ca you can change some immigration laws to uh, allow uh, more people to income. So you, you, you fill in that gap for, for caretakers because at the time, this is such a long time ago, 100,000 caretakers were lacking in Japanese society. There's the elderly needed help. And the, the, our Japanese team said, oh, no, we're not ready for that because, you know, they'll have kids and they need new schools and uh, we're not ready for that. Like, that's too soon. Um, and so she said, okay, what's, what's the solution? Robots, said the Japanese side. Like, we, we have robots. The technology is already here. Um, uh, we'll just, like, need to produce more of them and all good. And the, the, the girl on the, on the Canadian side said, if I give my grandma a robot, she's going to throw the robot out the window and tell me, you stay here and help me out. Like, there's no way my grandma is going to be okay with a robot. But the Japanese side was. And it was like this, this, this collision of two worlds, how we see the same problem, elderly care. And one wants immigration and the other one wants robotics. And, <laughs> and how do we match this? And then the, the, the professor that was um, helping guide this specific session, he sat us down and he gave us like a little course on cross communication. And he was saying how on the Japanese side, if they say it's difficult, it means it's a hard no. Like it's, it's difficult means no, it's not happening, but it's not polite to say no. And so when they sat down with the American team, the American team was saying, okay, it's difficult. Like how can we problem solve? Like, what's the problem? How can we solve it? And the Japanese Thai super confused kept saying, no, no, it's difficult. Like, <laughs> and, and so there was this clash. And so how, how this one example um, is that I, in most conversations that now I participate in, in most environments, I, I see myself a little bit as that prof on the outside that understood how these two were talking because I I've and obviously there are so many other environments that I haven't been in but in general I can most really mostly relate to to environments where people may be coming from Latin America North America Europe Asia uh, the African continent and understand that the reason why these these people are not understanding or just not getting them there's like these tiny little nonverbal or cultural things that are happening. And, and so what it's given me is the ability to have a wider lens and, and be able to communicate better, even when I don't speak the language. Like I don't speak Korean, but somehow I managed to communicate when I was in, in, in um, outside of Seoul in the temple with the monk like it it's so I think that that's very important and it for me this only happened by being thrown in there like had no choice but then taking a step back and observing how people eat how people talk how they think who talks first who bows their head first who 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 touches hands who doesn't and so I think that only comes from like really being thrown into the environment um, but that now that's given me a sense, a much better sense of understanding of where people come from, where they say, when they say this one sentence or they do this one thing and, um, and, and making, sh and like, and preventing that conflict 
comes from that because lots most times conflict comes from miscommunication and misunderstanding. Two people saying the same thing, uh, how to take care of grandma, <laughs> but one's on immigration, the other one's on robotics. And I, I think like for me, it's, it's changed my worldview because I feel like I mostly kind of get it. I don't agree. Many times, of course, I don't agree with the situation. There are many cases of, of gender discrimination and violence and conflict that I don't agree with at all. But at least I understand why they're saying it and where they're coming from. And for, I think this helps in, in across literally everything, in, in friendship, in business, in, in whatever it might be, just this observing of how people, where they come from. Um, not not place wise, just like how they act. It works in politics and international relations. Uh, a lot of the problems that we are now facing, be it offline or online, are result from this lack of. I would say first, there's lack of empathy, which is the emotional side of things. But then behind that, there's another layer, which is more intellectual, which is the lack of understanding of where this other person comes from. Of the thought process that preceded this reaction or this behavior or this approach or this whatever it is that, that is happening on the ground. Um, and I think in the 21st century, we desperately need that kind of bridge between different cultures, between different perspectives, between different approaches, because otherwise it's like uh, um, screaming at the top of your lungs in a language that another person doesn't understand and you're standing behind a wall, there's no other person for, there's no other way for the other person to understand what's happening, why the other person is screaming. And a matter of fact, you're screaming because you're, you're, you're overjoyed and they think you're, you need help or you scream because you need help and the other person would, would think you're overjoyed. And it's just, it's, <laughs> it's funny to say it this way, but it can end up in a lot of disasters. Uh, business-wise, friendship-wise, communication-wise, in politics, in, in, in religion, in, in across a variety of different, uh, different fields. Even that being said, path, yeah. Just uh, on a practical perspective, when we st I started working with the refugee women um, in the kitchen in Da Ferro, um, they, they wouldn't shake hands, wouldn't look in the eye, would look down, uh, would be more quiet. If it rains, they would send me a text message. It's raining today, so my husband doesn't want me to take the train. Raining, and if if I hadn't spent time in the Middle East as a like let's say traditional employer, I would think that like oh doesn't look in the eye is not trustworthy or is lying. Uh, you know this this culture and position because I knew uh, I knew this this relatively different thing about the rain and not leaving the house when it rains I understood where they came from and I was able to to give them a, a counter training on like what happens in in other contexts and and how to help them out and so I really think it's it's important really from a practice not even abstract but like yeah. everyday inclusion if from an inclusion perspective because they don't know the other doesn't know what they, they, that's how their world, where their world is coming from. Lina, you said a bit earlier that if you look at your career and your progress from the outside, it's completely random. But there are also some amazing, outstanding experiences. So uh, something that I think both us and our audience would love to know is, was it as easy as it looks like from the outside? That's one thing. And the second thing is... How, um, how do you think people who want to go on a same track of randomness uh, while being on a track of impact making, how do you think these people should think about their future and their pathway and the next step and the step after that? Um, for the, the ease question, um... I'm going to say the startup that I'm running now is, is straight up like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. If I had known like 10% of how hard it was, I wouldn't have done it. 
And the funny thing is that when I started it, I knew every step. It's like, oh, if only I get to this step, at least I won't have to be in the kitchen at 3 a.m. Covered head to toe date spread because the machine exploded. And then, and I got like heat burns all over me because it's heat control. I mean, I have like a thousand and one injuries from, from being in the kitchen and like the technical side. Uh, now, thank goodness we have a factory that like, produce it there and we went from like 50 darts to 50 60 a day to like 5,000 a day but the if if I knew how hard it was for sure I would not have started it and I think that's that's like the craziness of entrepreneurship right that <laughs> because you don't know you you jump into it and you're like cool and other entrepreneurs try to warn you and it's really like a stress test, depending on which field you are. Many times entrepreneurs, fellow peers will tell you, please don't do it. This is like such a bad, like life is going to be awful. Your finances will be going down to the ground. Your cortisol will be like going out of your ear. I mean, all of these things. And if those horror stories still don't deter you and you still try doing it and you get into it, that's like, it shows that you're, you really want to do this and you're really passionate and you're like, you're crazy enough <laughs> to, to, to continue it. So the entrepreneurship, the startup right now, it's it's a million times harder. Of course, on, on the outside, what's what we put out most, although I put a lot of like things about being vulnerable, about um, things that didn't work out, um, it's, it's still hard to capture on camera that exact moment right? Because sometimes it's so much of a crisis. So I'm going to say people see like less than 5% of the problem. <laughs> and it's extremely difficult. The other projects, many were very hard, like the virtual reality project, the hardest part wasn't even the technical side. It was collecting the stories of, of refugees who had done the journey from Syria to Germany themselves. And I, I collected, like, I was the one who collected all their narratives and compiled a common narrative. And I, I just wasn't prepared for what I would hear. I thought I was. I had studied about it. I read the news. Like, that's what I spent a year of master's doing. And then when I was uh, Zoom to Zoom, uh, because they were in Europe, I was in, in the U.S. Um, doing this, um, I, I remember once I just, I started crying and I, I told the woman, um, I'm so sorry this happened to you. And blah, blah. I just like, I, I started crying. And she looked at me like, I'm fine. I'm safe. Like, I'm good. I mean, she, she was just like, that's in the past. Why are you like, why are you crying? I'm not crying. <laughs> and, 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 and so that part was harder than the technical side. And then other projects, to be honest, it was so, I think it was so new, so different, so that the daily part, it didn't felt hard. And it just felt like, oh, wow, everything is so new and cool, like Bambi-eyed when you start something new. So it really depends. But the startup, super, super, super freaking hard. Um, your second question, which I now forgot. <laughs> which is the advice about people who, uh, who want to embark on this journey of randomness, because you worked on a variety of different projects throughout, throughout the years. And some people are drawn to this. People who are multi-potentialites, who have a multicultural background, who are polymaths, they're drawn to this, but this is incredibly hard. So what advice would you give them other than one, ignorance is bliss for the entrepreneur. And two, what was the second one? Ignorance is bliss. And oh, uh, crazy enough it is, it is, a, is a threshold. So we already have these two things, ignorance and crazy enough as, as a threshold. What else do you have? I think communication to others because mm -hmm. your journey, like if, if you did those things, it's because you're passionate, you loved it. In that moment, that's what was right for you. And if, if people are, are polymaths, poly, whatever you want to call it, that's, that, that opportunity feels right at that moment. So you went for it. But if you're trying to get another job or you're trying to score a project or a contract or whatever, and the person in front of you is worried that you are not going to um, do their project well because your head is all over the place, it's your job to explain to them why it's not, why there's a common thread. 
And so in while I was doing it, obviously, I had no clue. But afterwards, when I like after my master's, when I, I thought about jobs and everything, I thought, OK, I need to find a narrative in, <laughs> in this. And I, I, I saw the narrative, which was business for social good. Across all of it, it was like, how can we use the private sector to promote, um, to promote either small entrepreneurs or vulnerability or whatever. So really like the communication on an external perspective, it's very important because as much as we're working every day, like, I don't live in a bubble. I live in a world where I have customers and, and investors and, and everything else. So it's my job to make other people secure. Now, if I do my best and they still don't buy it, then that's just not the relationship for perhaps for me. That's maybe not the right investor. That's maybe not the right client, et cetera. But it's my job to make that first step and not have them do the guesswork of like, what is she all about? Um, and, um, and so I think that's really important to like know how to package your randomness in a, in a, in a sense of like, oh, this makes sense. That's, that's wonderful. You said a word that I absolutely love, which is the narrative. And this is very common in, 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 in psychology, uh, in literature, obviously, because narrative is at, at the center of all literary work. Um, but it's also very important in psychology. Uh, and, and basically, you have more or less two narratives, the positive narrative and the negative one. The negative one, which is I'm a victim of my circumstances. I cannot do this and so on and so forth. And then you have the other narrative, which is, okay, whatever comes my way, I will be able to manage it. So based on, on McAdams uh, narratives of victimization and, and empowerment, and you can compare it to the hero's journey. You can compare it to your own kind of story and to storytelling. But the idea is when you design the right narrative for us, the positive narrative, the narrative that secure, that inspires a sense of security and confidence and trust, in the person we're talking with, it completely transforms the way we look at ourselves first. Because all of a sudden it's not, oh, I like this and I like that. No, I like this kind of, as you said, common thread that expresses itself in so many different ways. Um, and once you repackage it, again, I'm, I'm stealing some of your words because I absolutely love the way you framed it. Uh, once you repackage it, you find meaning for yourself, because all of a sudden you understand why you were all over the place for the past 10 years and you allow others to understand that as well. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think really like the communication side is we talked about it right earlier from a cross cultural perspective, even cross cultural, like how Lena's culture of, of me as a human being, how I communicate that to whoever else because uh, I am, it, it has nothing to do truthfully with like just a one specific country or one group of, of events that happened to you. Really fascinating. Just, I, I like watching the way, the way a lot of these subjects weave back and forth together and they'll come up again and again, but it's, it's just very sort of interesting to me to see the way all of it makes this, this complete narrative, as you guys were saying. And I'm honestly just going through the, the, list of, the list of projects that you've been on. From my perspective, it doesn't, it doesn't look like, oh, like they're, they're so different. They're so randomized. It, no, it, it looks like this one person has done all of these amazing things, has accomplished all of that. And like, really? Like, they've got to be like 50, 60, right? No? What? They're, they're, are you kidding? This is amazing. Like, anybody doing a lot of the things that you've gotten through, I mean, I would just be incredibly, incredibly impressed by. But also describing a lot of the, the difficulties, describing a lot of what you've been through with it is, is fascinating. Just amazing to me. And... I'm absolutely, absolutely overjoyed that we get the chance to talk to you about it and sort of go into, into this experience with you because it should be celebrated. It is amazing. And I know that's my perspective on it, but um, I, I, think, I think it would be fantastic to be able to keep sort of celebrating that particular 
perspective that acts in a way as a cheerleader for you because whether you need it or not, it's amazing. And I think that there are a lot of other people out there in the world who need to see that example and who need to understand that they're, they're just as capable if they can sort of make this, this momentary alignment in their heads that, that the narrative doesn't have to be negative, that the narrative will have difficulties, but that, that things can be done. And a support structure can be built. I'm a little off topic from where I wanted to be. I, I wanted to actually ask about, um, about DeFerro. Um, you're running an enterprise that is, you're running, oh, oh, perfect, an example, this is good. Get some product placement in here. Bring that in close, <laughs> let's see if we can see what's going on. So this Just is the so DeFerro How do you do, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So it's, it's a date spread in space. Right. Basically, and it even matches. It's like yeah. almost. It's almost yeah, it's like pretty I good did with it the colors. <laughs> right. This is good branding. But um, so your enterprise, you're employing women from the refugee community. You're making date-based products. You are expanding to what was it forty-six locations in the the U.S. and the West Coast, and and. Um, it's amazing to see that kind of work. And honestly, I, when I had heard just that you had an enterprise that was trying to focus on creating opportunities for people who are marginalized, that's, you know, I, I wanted to have you on the podcast just because of that. Um, but I'd like to hear your, your opinion, your perspective about how social entrepreneurship can be a force for good because this is something that I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily accept. There's, even for myself, going into a startup, building my own startup, I've had this, this concept, of course I want to do things better, I have very specific values in mind, but I want people to be able to understand that perspective as much as possible. Um, what are your thoughts as far as social entrepreneurship as a force for good? Uh, my thoughts are that it's it's one of the keys to unlocking you know sustainable a sustainable world in the future right because part of this social entrepreneurship means um, means inclusive employment practices it means um, a, a green supply chain sourcing everything um, it means rerouting traditional profits and putting them into uh, a sustainable way of having impact, whatever you choose that impact to be. Many social enterprises are environmental. Um, there, there's so many, the, the faces of social entrepreneurship are, are, are thousands, hundreds of thousands. And so how, how I see it is, is really a way to make both ends sustainable it's also the direction that commerce is going in general. So I was reading about um, consumers and uh, Gen Z are about to be the, the largest consumer base in the world. You look at, <laughs> you look at the Middle East and, and last time I saw that statistic was that something like 70% of the population is under 35 years old. Um, and in, in, the, in North America, um, you see them as agents of change for who they, what they stand for, what brands they represent, who they, what brands they tattoo on their body. Um, and so it's, it's turning into a, a, a point where it, it will become a non-negotiable. Obviously, it really depends on the, the income level, the purchasing power of, of the person buying the product. You can't afford to be picky when all you can afford is one type of food. Of course, there's a threshold. Of course, there's a threshold. But there are, are many ways to build product services and supply chains that, that make it inclusive for everyone. Now, what the, the, the let's say the negative side to that is, is that 
the ecosystem is not catching up. And what I what I mean by that is like, I I have uh, a, a food based social enterprise. So from this jar of date spread, we um, it's it's no sugar added. So like the type of ingredients and the farming practices and the quality source are um, like very rigorous and strict. From this, we use the sales of, of this to fund education programs for refugee and trafficked women and create those programs. And it's a lot of work. It's expensive. It's, it's not easy to, to make a product that is the same or, or even more affordable market value while having all these qualities. There's a reason why there's fillers and things added to it. And from a consumer perspective, it's great, right? They, they love it. They love that they're doing good things. I, the, the reason why I started this was, was really like vulnerable community support. So I feel comfortable with it. But now when I, when I go to the supermarket chain and I want to sell my product, well, the problem is they apply the same rules that they do with, with traditional products. They, they want the same amount of, so in this industry, you either pay for your shelf or you give free product the first time you give a whole case of your free product per store to the, to the grocery store. If it sells, then they'll order from you paid. Um, they require very expensive promotional um, things. And how do we afford that? How do we remain competitive? And when the consumer wants what we want, and when we're providing something good, but obviously by default, the margins are lower. And now the traditional industry treats us as traditional. Yeah. That's not, that's where I see the roadblock practically. I, I, I don't think it's fair that the distributors and the stores and everything else in the supply chain treats you as, as a just like profit generating business because we're doing so much more. And it's, it's not possible to have that type of cash flow and, and just on a practical perspective. So that's where I see the roadblock. That's where I, I really think the systemic change, if it's a product-based business, will have to come in a supply chain. I give the example of foods, but like food, you can have candles, you can have furniture, you can have whatever it is. I know mm -hmm. so many social entrepreneurs in different fields. And so I really think that there needs to be some more some more systematic um, change because, uh, and it's not just in the form of B Corp because we work with B Corps and sorry to say, but even in how they do their procurement, it, it's, it's just as intense and, and cuts our margins. Um, so that's, that's, I would say the pros and the cons and what really needs to be changed because the consumers have changed their mind. The entrepreneurs are ready to create things. Even investors are changing their mind. They're, they're adapting, but now we need the practical side. Like how do you move product and how do you sell product? That needs to change because you just, you can't keep fitting in that same shoe. That's agreed. There are a lot of, a lot of the models that we have economically, logistically, they're, they're outdated. And we don't think about exactly how outdated until we're really trying something different. And then again, that lack of flexibility, that lack of adaptation that exists in a tried and true system. This is just how you do it. These are the rules. Like, who says? You really wanna risk your profit margins? because you want to do something that was thought up 60, 70 years ago, and you can't even tell me why you do it. Yeah. Like these, and it's, it's not just products, it's, it's services, it's, it's everything that is absolutely changing. And I, I agree 100% that we need to be able to analyze these complex systems, because that's part of what the circular economy is about. It's about every stage of the process being holistically broken down as individual mechanical elements that, you know, if, if one distributor, as you've described, or one grocery store chain um, is doing things this way, there should be enough flexibility in the system, enough competitors that have the opportunity to really think about doing things differently. 
Otherwise, you don't have that, that robust flexibility. You don't have that competitive edge that is what capitalism is supposed to be about. And it's something that's been missing to a large extent from capitalism is that that ability to experiment and try things and fail and have lots of other competitors doing the exact same sort of experimentation. We've gotten to a point where we've just broken up the existing market between a couple of players and they will do things how they have been doing things because they've got all the market. And it's even that is, is changing dramatically. So I do hope that people can be sort of more aware of that and, and sort of involving themselves in this process because I've seen a lot of enterprise lately making really sort of drastic changes because someone will come onto the scene and for example, uh, Generate is a, a current browser that is putting out ad-free alternatives in which any user using Generate can have their entire online experience ad-free. If they want, they can do what everyone else is doing. They can have, you know, personalized ads, cookies to a degree, but it'll be based on what they actually want and they get paid for it. The user gets that profit share. 70 to 90% of it and generate gets the 30 to 10. And that is going to murder all of the classic advertising firms that have been using the ubiquitousness of the tracking cookie to just continue doing business as, as it's been done. It's, it's a model that's antiquated and that is annoying and that consumers don't want. If it's my data, then I should get paid for it or no one should get paid for it. It's not for sale. And the fact that we've got consumers looking at these systems is fascinating to me. Thank you for, for taking, taking the time to answer that question and for putting up with my, my rambly response. It's, it's really fascinating to me to, to sort of hear it from such a different, a different sector of a startup from my own, because my own is very much content and service based. It's, um, it's interesting to see those kinds of roadblocks that are experienced when you're creating a product. And I think part of the problem also maybe stems from like truly identifying who are, which are social enterprises because outside yeah. of four or five countries, there's no legal entity to yeah. say that you're a social enterprise. Um, and, and TBD on whether they're like in the UK they have, but the, even the regulations are very strict um, of 51% uh, of profits go back to the venture. Well, that, that limits you from any investors. Maybe you're making incredible impact, but it's not mm -hmm. exclusively from a profit side. So um, I, um, in, in parallel to the Pharaoh now, and this is the first time I'm openly talking about it, um, I'm, I'm working with a former intern of the Pharaoh, now turned colleague, um, to create um, the, the first global certification program for social enterprises to help them clearly identify um, what they stand for um, and, and help them also building up communities where they can interact with, with peers um, in, a, in a very like peer-to-peer -peer way and manner. And, and hopefully this experiment um, and, and new idea and launch will, will help push the movement forward and, and be something like, like a fair trade, uh, something like what fair trade and organic and other things did. Even though organic has its whole other, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> USD organic, USDA organic, but I'm not going to go into that in detail, but just to say that like mm -hmm. what that signaling means, hopefully that'll help um, push the movement forward. Exactly. To set a standard. What you said, yeah, what you said, Paul, about adaptability in terms at, at the big level and at the corporate level um, is important. And there's another concept, which is profit, which is how much profit are we making? Because this is the key driver of the system as it is built now. 
Um, and we are seeing a shift in that sense. When it comes, for instance, for social entrepreneurship from the investment perspective, we see a lot more investors going into that direction. If it's not solely in the direction of social entrepreneurship, at least there are ESG components in the investment criteria, uh, which would also push the big players towards a, a different way of approaching business, of approaching profit, of approaching production, of approaching a dissemination and distribution. And it affects the entire chain uh, in, in that sense. So this is absolutely absolutely important uh, to, to mention. Now, the question is, is this shift going to be enough to transform the entire system? Because the system actually needs to be changed and transformed and reinvented if we want to build a future that is decent for, for everybody and that aligns with both our purposes and needs and aligns with the possibility of it existing. Since we've, we've been exhausting our resources for so many years. So this is kind of a question that, uh, that pushes us to act, to act more, to act more efficiently, and that is absolutely important. And signaling is something that is also very important in education uh, in terms of traditional, everything that should move from traditional to non-traditional needs a signaling system to create this kind of trust, legitimacy, direction, that would allow these newcomers to thrive in a field that is not originally theirs or that was not built for them. And this is where angels of chaos and, and misfits and, uh, and disruptors and the people with, for whom we are actually creating this interchange, uh, this is where these, these people have a role to play because in a system that compels you to fit in, they naturally don't. And so naturally they have to create a place. And this is a place between spaces, a space between spaces, a place for everybody else, uh, those who do not fit into molds, a space where we can actually reinvent the way we do things and the way um, law is done, the way enterprises are built and created, the way business is established, the way uh, countries talk to each other uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, and I really want to go back to this very initial idea, which is how you, through your undergrad, created these kind of small blocks of success that you managed to get up to your final year and this is exactly what we need to do, is that we need to build those kind of small boxes of revolution, of change, of interchange, of, uh, of transformation, and kind of put them together and design this new picture that, that we want to see. So from a metaphorical perspective. All right, so the time has come in our program to focus on the Rapid 7. Now, this is something fun that we do, fairly lighthearted. Do your best to answer the questions in as short an answer as you can. Usually one word will do just fine. We're going to just rattle them off back and forth and see how you feel about it. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. Question number one. Cat or dog? Dog. That was super fast. Okay, second question. Favorite season? Uh, summer. Mm. Okay. Describe the future in one word. Sparkly. Describe the present in one word. Needs to be dusted off. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, describe your state of mind in one word. Energetic. What is your most inspiring art form? Dance. And finally, an inspirational message or advice in no more than five words. Everything is better with sprinkles. <laughs> It'll do. I, I think you got it. Five words, right? That is five words. Everything's, yeah, okay, yeah. 
Everything like is better with sprinkles. I like it. I like it. At metaphorical sprinkles, like a spark and yeah. like a sprinkly future or spa oh, no, it was sparkly future. But yeah, sparkly, sparkly sprinkly. <laughs> a little of both wouldn't be bad. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of dance, I'm not sure if you know that, but the last uh, um, interchange that we have uh, recorded and that we have published was actually with a dancer. His name is Bert Proshoff. He's from Germany. Um, and he's involved in digital transformation uh, in, in Germany with, with UVEX Group, uh, previously with IBM. And, uh, and he has been a dancer and a coach and a winner of competitions for the past 30 years. Wow. So I, I have a sense that dance is, it appears to be somewhat of a common thread <laughs> in this interchange series. This is yeah. something that we need to investigate. Are, are all our hosts, are all our guests dancers? Because one of the hosts here is a dancer. And one of them is dance curious. You know, it's, it's worth checking out. So, so it would be interesting to see the relationship between art and, and change. Wow, yeah. this, is, this is an interesting question. What do you think about this, Lena? Art and change. Well, I think art in any form, it forces you to make different connections, right? In your brain, it, it makes you more creative. It makes you more... Um, I, I, I mean, I remember reading a lot of actual like scientific research on dance and memory and creativity and, and cortisol and serotonin and all of that. So I don't know. I think it gives you like, it gives you a release and it gives you time off from the active task. And that's when creativity happens and innovation happens, right? It's when it's during the time off that your neurons are like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. let me think about this, this different new thing. Mm -hmm. um so that's the only like non-scientific <laughs> explanation um i can give um for me it's like when i when i dance salsa or bachata which is the type that i that type of dance i dance the most it's it's like meditation and it's like a mental reset and it's the only time in my life when i'm not thinking gym walks in nature i mean everything I'm still on, like I can't turn it off, even though I'm working on meditation. But when I dance, it's the only time I'm a thousand percent in the present and have no other thoughts. And I feel like for me, it's like mental floss. And um, and finding that was, honestly, they changed my life, finding that outlet. And I think if everybody has their own different thing, um, but that it's super important to not, not neglect on a weekly basis. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because my experience of dance is a bit different uh, because it's not the kind of social dance, because salsa and bachata, they're very social, social dances. Dance, yeah. And my experience of dance is like competitive dance sport. Like I have 10 dances, five Latin, five standard, five ballroom, and I need to differentiate between all of these different dances. And each dance has a character. You cannot perform the samba in the same way you perform the vaults because if it's the same, then we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very strong problem and then Interesting there's the choreography also. and then there's the layer the music layer and then there's the story layer and then there's the partnering skills um and then there's the improvisation uh, if, if if you're good at it and then there's the memorization because you already have your choreography but then when you perform it in 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 the uh, on the dance floor on a dance floor where you you used to perform it so basically in your own studio uh, and you go and dance it on a competition dance floor with a very different kind of setup, you really need this kind of mental flexibility to kind of recreate your, your references. Where's left, where's right, where's forward, where's backward, uh, and, and how to go around the dance floor without kind of uh, messing with the choreography, uh, and how you can work out the the, the interaction with the other dancers because sometimes you would be doing your own routine and then another couple would would jump in front of you oh, what yeah. do you do now do you stop and freeze like oh i'm afraid now or do you do you play with the other couple and you create something new and different and, and special so it's it's actually the opposite of mental floss it's like a huge mental <laughs> exercise 
um, that contains all these different elements and that is definitely, definitely very actively engaged in connections because you have to connect to your creativity. You have to connect with your body because thinking is just very, it's very active, but in the same time, it's very passive. Dancing is sort of, everything is, everything is working. Your hands, your arms, your, your back, your, your, your stomach, uh, your legs, your feet, uh, your, your toes, like everything is super active and the experience of it is, is, is something else entirely. And how I feel the connection between art, like dance or something else and change, one connection is intensity because art is all about telling a story with an intensity by being in the moment, by being present, by working out all these different connections by embracing co complexity and, and saying something with it, simplifying to a point where it can be shared in this very powerful way. And I, ch I think change for it to be successful needs to do the same thing in a way. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Paul, what do you have to say? I completely disagree with everything that has been said. <laughs> Of course. No, I, I just, I just wanted to try that. I, I feel like I agree an awful lot in this, uh, in this program. But it's, um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think it's incredible to just be able to dig into, dig into what it is that lets you reach that state that you described, where mm -hmm. the mind isn't just constantly running. It's, it's a problem I've had um, that has. For years, I've had some degree of insomnia, partially because trying to meet a normal daily routine where you wake up at a certain time, that is expected by, you know, most of society, you're waking up in time to get to work and, you know, get things started, do a nine to five, that doesn't work with my brain. My brain wants to kick into high gear around five, six in the evening and then work until four in the morning. And it certainly doesn't want to be asleep during that time. And, you know, I can force myself to be, you know, on a schedule where I'm going to sleep at nine at night and waking up at, you know, whatever time in the morning so that I can have, you know, breakfast, commute, everything. But it still doesn't really stop the activity in my brain. And getting that to stop, because you really have to get that to stop at least once a week if you can reach that point then life gets so much easier. And when you're doing that, that something, whatever it is, some form of artistic expression or creation, if you can get to that point where all the noise stops, then suddenly you, you get so much more done. And it's, it's nice to be able to sort of draw the line between, is this something that I am looking at technically, where I have to really be involved with all of the minutia, the details, the placement, is it becoming more technically complex or is it something that's clearing that out? The first time I experienced that, one of the first times anyway, was with snowboarding, partially because when you're going down a mountain fast enough, then everything else doesn't matter because you may flip the, you know, the edge of the board and then just face plant down at a angle across a sheet of ice that's been broken up into jagged shards like glass. It's like, there's no room for thinking about, you know, what, what, what did that person say to me earlier today? <laughs> no, it's like, it's gone. Right now, all that matters is you and the mountain. And there's an odd tranquility in that. I don't know. I think it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to touch on. And I want to thank you for being able to sort of get this wrapped up with such a, a sort of profound moment, because this is the sort of thing that all of us really need. And I think it's key to adaptability. If you can find that peace from time to time, just a little bit, then yeah. life gets easier. I've, I've had conversations with, with friends recently. Actually, I was talking to Alexandra earlier about the idea of of toxic masculinity. And one of my, my core problems with it 
is this idea that um, poetry, dance, music, it's something that gets denied to a lot of a lot of men. And because of it, there's no no expression. And because of it, you know, when you hit a hard time, when someone's died or a relationship ends or you're really frustrated, you don't have the room to to write a song, to to sing your pain away, to play the blues, to to express yourself in a poem. And that's when you need it, is when somebody's died or when it feels like it and your heart is just in tatters. Without that, all these poor guys have got is the room to punch a wall. And it's no no good for anybody. Certainly not any good for them, no good for anybody around them. It's incredibly imbalancing. And I think being able to to forge a tomorrow, a future timeline, if we can pivot into that in a way that gives people the resources that they need so that they're creating it with us, then I think that we're in a much more fantastic position. On behalf of the Time Repair Corporation, I wanna thank you once again for being a part of this conversation, for joining us today. It has been really, really incredible having you here. Thank you so much for inviting me, for giving the, the time. Honestly, I had such a great time with you, Paul and Alexandra. Yeah, and on behalf of Perset, both Perset and, and the Time Repair Corporation, on behalf of what Interchange stands for and the kind of uh, artists slash misfits slash angels of chaos, um, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sh thank you for sharing your experiences, your background, your stories, your artistic inclinations, <laughs> which obviously we share. Um, and thank you so much for for your time and for your uh, for spreading. I'm I'm referring to the date spread here and for spreading uh, the joy and, and pleasure and happiness. It was such a beautiful, beautiful interchange. I had an awesome time. <laughs> Bye everyone and see you next time. Bye-bye.